Hello, Mike. Long How are you doing? Um, very well. It's already afternoon and it's early morning for you, right? Yeah, seven. Seven. That's horrible. Um, I have to get up at seven to make these tutorials starting at uh, the, to make this workshop starting at nine. It's yeah. Horrible. I don't. That, well. <laughs> well, it's it's like. Uh, it's from your side. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's better than our workshops, I think, in in Bratislava when we had to wake up at seven and walk up and down a humongous hill every morning. <laughs> And also the evenings were not so easy, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The evening, early morning, uh, a lot of teaching. Maybe we yeah. should explain. Maybe we should explain a little. Uh, <laughs> was, Mike was teaching a couple of workshops, summer schools. Uh, was it was it more than two? I think it was more than two. Yeah, I think it was. It, we did it for like three years in a row with yeah. Mateusz and you. With Mateusz Twierczyski and myself, and also at that time organized uh, together with uh, Fabio Pavelli and. Yeah. Roger, uh, Roger and yeah. Yeah. So, so, but that's some time ago. It's like uh, 2013, 14, maybe. Yeah, 13, 14, something 14, like that. 15. Yeah, I, I think yeah. so. So, uh, for me, the, those were the, the first really big workshops that you were teaching, and um, yeah, at that time I was I was following, and, and yeah, I remember I remember. Um, uh, Mateusz said at one of the workshops that uh, whatever can be done in Grasshopper, the two of you can do it. Uh, <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, yeah. he's bragging. I know, now, I know, now I know he was right. Now if, I know that's true. If, whatever can be done. If anyone can do it, it's Mateusz. <laughs> because he yeah. can hack somehow, you know? He, he's missing a... I think your voice is cutting out. Yeah, it cut out. <laughs> yeah. I still don't hear you. Now you can hear me, right? Yeah. Again, there is a that happened in the morning as well. These headphones, they've got a switch, and I can switch off the, the microphone, and it just happens. It does. <laughs> you just hit it on stuff, yeah. I, I didn't. I didn't know that. What, what were we talking about? Yeah. Never uh, mind. Something about Mateusz. And... <laughs> uh, I actually, I actually should invite him as well. I think this is really uh, last minute, also with you, uh, because uh, we have to say that you were watching yesterday. Uh, yeah. When I was uh, telling people I never use plugins, and they were like, "Oh, come on!" Uh, and <laughs> after, after a while, and, and we decided to do this together. And I'm really happy that uh, that yeah. <laughs> this could be a yeah. nice conversation. I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It was uh, it was good. I was watching it yesterday. It was. Uh, yeah. I, I didn't see this morning, but I. I what did you just talk about this morning? Uh, this morning, I was I was uh, talking about. Um, all the activities that we did with uh, with the research, which is actually the platform that invited you here to do the workshops, um, and I I didn't uh, go all the way to to the workshops, but before even that, uh, we were organizing a lot of debates and conferences and stuff. So I stopped, I was talking about that. Mainly, I was explaining to the people why uh, did we start organizing public events uh, whatsoever, uh, because the thing is that uh, when you are at a place like this. Um, which is not really on the top of the road, um, and you want to do something that is very global, then uh, the only way how to how to get in touch with people who do what you do is to invite them, because otherwise they wouldn't know about yeah. you. And also, when you want to remain relevant, you you need to uh, you need to be um, contemporary, and you need to know what other people are doing, um, and um, and you also need to have a good excuse to actually meet people. So I was also talking about the meetups that we were organizing. Uh, mm -hmm. You were not part of that because you were in the U.S. and we didn't have the budget to get you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But we organized four of the meetups. Um, uh, with then we ran out of money and couldn't really afford uh, another one. Um, yeah. We ran out of funding. Um, but th that was also an uh, awesome event that we made. 
um, because that was that was like a very relaxed conference where people were coming and just talking to the peers. Uh, people were talking about what they, what are they doing just just to inform uh, somebody who is really interested and somebody who could be a collaborator in the future and so on. So yeah. so we made one in Bratislava, then one in Paris, then one in Prague, and and Paris again. Uh, the last one was in 2018, and and last year we, uh, it was so hectic and we didn't have time for the fundraising, so we. We ran out of uh, funding and we didn't do it. And now we've got this uh, pandemic. So uh, organizing a conference is probably not the best business uh, today. Yeah. But yeah, I was just going to ask you, I mean, it, it seemed like, you know, back then um, or even before this pandemic, it was a bit more, it was like a bit more special. I don't know, in some way, like the, I don't know, it, it was a bit more sl like selective, I think, in a way, you know, um, now it's like, I think it's good now for like the students, right? Because they have so much to pick from. Um, but it must be difficult also to like decide what to pick, especially um, where we're in a we're in a uh, kind of market where there's less jobs, right? So like people have less money, and so it's like you you have to be like wise where you spend your money and it's like there's 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 all this great content but who's like filtering it or what's filtering it you know or like how do you, you know yeah i know i know uh now mainly you're speaking about the online stuff that um that we both are producing um yeah. uh you were also part of, of uh, what i started with the, with the sessions then you started yeah. your own thing with the design morphine yeah. uh yeah, and I, I, we actually, I, I actually can see that uh, during this uh, pandemic, everybody was streaming, everybody was putting out um, free tutorials, and I can actually see it that uh, people are uh, diversifying much more, uh, which means that um, we have a little bit less people um, uh, watching our uh, tutorials. But actually, it, I, I expected that to be even worse. Uh, I expected that now when there's so much content for free, then uh, that people would wouldn't be interested in stuff that is paid but it's not the case we still yeah. have some some customers uh and i'm very happy about that and i'm yeah. kind of well uh, did you did you, uh, did you uh, have a chance to actually watch the, all the well some of the free tutorials that people are now posting on facebook did you have a chance uh here and there i don't have so much time for like tutorials these days like so i try to like if i watch anything I, I try to watch stuff that like I'll, I'll need to learn from because um, it like you know a lot of the free stuff is like it's like a lot of stuff that like we already know but it's really good for like beginners you know um, you know as as we get older in our careers we have to be wiser in the time we spend watching things you know so so uh, yeah I mean I, I see I, I see I, mostly I see like what's going on but I don't usually have time like to, to check it out. Uh, the reason why I'm asking you is that I would really like to know whether the content is, is actually good. Because if if um, if people are producing a lot of content and it's not good, then it's it's a bad situation for everybody. If the content is good, it's a bad situation for us when we are selling the content. But it's good for everybody else. I just don't know. Um, I, I didn't have a chance to, to, to watch. I mean, I think all the content, I mean, I can see like people I guess you can tell like which kind of content is interesting by like how many people are kind of re sharing it and more excited about it in a way, but you, you can't, I guess, really ever even know the kind of aftermath uh, of that um, situation uh, unless you're in it. Like for, for us, we, we can tell like how successful or not successful we are uh, in, in my opinion, mostly by like repeat People like people that keep coming back, which we have a lot of. Um, I think, I think means like you're doing something that people like, you know. Um, even like, even we'll do the same topic multiple times and have the same people coming. Um, I don't know. Maybe they just like learning from us. I don't know. <laughs> um, but that's one thing. Um, I don't know. If for yeah. them, it's the same case. Like I was talking about the the conferences. For them, it's uh it's their ticket to to the world that they like. Uh, it's it's the their way to to being part of what they want to be part of. 
So, yeah. so even even though they might already know the stuff, they, they keep coming because that's something that they like, uh, mm -hmm. something that they don't want to miss out. We had the same uh, when we were organizing the, the real life workshops, when people were actually traveling and coming to one place. There are people who, who came to the fifth workshop and I was asking them, why are you still coming? You, you already know all the stuff. And they said, okay, I just like it here and I yeah. like the setup. Yeah, so maybe that's, that's the thing. That's the thing I definitely miss. Like, I think the, the like going places is like, um, you know, like the, there's all this kind of like, like <clears throat> there's a big push from like Microsoft and and Apple and whatever for like more like VR conference environments, but like, which are good for the moment. But I just think like, at least me, like I, I missed that, like that real, Inter there's just nothing like it and then like going and having a real beer with your friends afterwards you know like there <laughs> that, that's the fault of that you always have um on, on these conferences and, and all the networking that you do uh meanwhile yeah. and yeah. you can't really do it online and yeah but yeah. it's like um but, but that was also also the reason why why we did that and also you remember we always made sure that that um when you came here it was also fun for for the tutors yeah exactly yeah it's like it, it it's the the part of the experience you know like just just to meet new people and and get to go places and i i highly suggest everyone who hasn't do that once this kind of pandemic is you know because i mean it, it's it, it's not good but <laughs> it's also not forever just like any pandemic you know so um it's just like, a, a, you know, I don't know how, no one knows how long it have to last, but these things come and go. And so yeah. uh, I hope that we go back to, uh, you know, things will be different, but you know, it's, it's, I don't think anyone's saying, well, that's it. We're all going to stay home now forever. No. <laughs> we're just, just talking to, to my colleagues, uh, with my colleagues, uh, we saw the, the photos from, from the UK uh, where, the first sunny day, half a million people went to the beach to the, to the same, yeah. and they, it was so packed. Uh, it, it it shows that people are actually eager for these things, and they are missing it a lot. And you can see it here; it's it's sunny, and and everything seems to be like settling down here, and everything seems to, seems to be good now. And everybody is outside, and everybody is meeting, and so on. But the numbers are rising, and yeah. yeah. But, but, yeah. but I mean, it shows. I'm in the U.S., so you don't have to tell me about numbers rising. <laughs> So are you still in the lockdown? Do, are you still staying at home? Uh, I mean, I stay at home mostly um, just because I, I don't want, you know, to get sick. But uh, um, I, I would say, like, I'm pretty self-cautious uh, about the situation. But there are definitely a lot of people going out um, in big gatherings, you know. So uh, Florida is crazy right now. I think they had, like, 10,000 new cases yesterday, like in one day. So it's just like pretty, pretty insane. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I just can't wait to like, um, I, I just wonder what happens to all this digital content or, or, or people even relying on just making digital content. Like, I wonder what happens after, because I, I, I have a suspicion that as soon as we can, no one's going to be going to want to be on the computer anymore uh, after being inside for so long. But I think we can we can actually see it on the numbers when when we put the videos on on YouTube, you will see uh, how many people actually watched it. And uh, it seems like um, uh, there is there is a peak at the beginning when you publish something, and then nobody cares after that. Uh, yeah, I mean that's that's the hard part about online content is it's. I think the, the value of it goes away a lot quicker because um, like when you went to the workshops, when you went to the workshop, you, you, you kind of brought this experience along with you. And, and honestly, I could say like all the best moments that I remember from all the workshop experiences weren't actually even like the, I don't even remember like what I taught half the time, you know, like, like, I don't, but, but I remember all the experiences and all the interactions and all the people, but like webinars I've taken, like, I kind of like in the moment, it was awesome. And then I kind of like, you, you, as soon as it's over the, the disconnection happens like a lot quicker, I think. 
Um, and then you're kind of like on to the next one and on to the next one. Um, and then as a content creator, it's just really hard because it's like how many different ways can you teach Grasshopper, you know, like, or, or something, you know, so um, it's hard to keep generating content as quickly as an online platform requires that to stay relevant and successful, I think. And there is one, one more problem with the online content because um, now I'm, um, I don't really have much time reading, but I still have a, a good uh, share of time uh, listening to, to lectures. So, so I do actively listen to a lot of lectures, like really daily I'm listening to, to lectures. And uh, with all the online content that is being generated, it's really difficult to find uh, good uh, content that you can listen to because mostly um, the new stuff that is being created is very uh, tightly bound to, to the current situation. So I can, I can find a lot of uh, debates about the, the pandemic situation and how people uh, are coping with that but it's usually just some sort of a small talk and that's not something that I would be that much interested and probably uh, in a year from now or two, I wouldn't be interested at all. So you can find a lot of stuff that, that interesting people are now uh, generating, but it's not a general stuff. It's not something that, that I really want to learn. It's, it's an information that I get very close to some tabloid information. Like, uh, yeah. And, yeah. and that's also some sort of problem. I, yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, the, like, don't get me wrong, all the online stuff is, awesome. I think it's, like, great, like, for the moment, like, it's, course, it's really great. Yeah, I mean, that as well, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I mean, we've been doing it before a, a pandemic, you know, so um, to, to try to have, like, a more global reach, but even those people, I always, you know, before this, I was, I always was, like, you know, if you really want a good experience, you should, you should really try to get to the workshop, you know. Uh, there's just no substitute for it. Um, no, because you also see how serious people are about the stuff and how uh, how strongly they are behind their own thoughts. That that was that was a great experience for me when I was studying in Vienna because because you can you can read all the articles about about all the famous people and you can you can uh, follow any blogs, but then meeting them is completely different because then you you see that the little peculiarities that they when they talk about their stuff, you can you can get a much better sense of what is important and what is not, and yeah. that same happens uh, also with the workshops. Because usually people who are already ready to to teach a workshop an international workshop, they they usually have something to say, and beyond just the tooling thing, it, they it, you know you know that yourself that you are giving also some sort of strategies and and yeah. global overview of what you are doing like uh, authorship and stuff. Yeah, I, th I think it, it it's just a it's a the one thing I find a little strange is that I, I just feel like a lot of people, like you said, like all the podcasts or whatever, they're like COVID-19 oriented. And I just feel like, I just feel like a lot of media is treating the, the kind of like temporary situation as like what it is now. But, you know, like people are trying to go back. And I, I think like we all kind of prove if we didn't know already that like okay working from home is possible but but like you know for instance for me like I work from home since February and it wasn't difficult it was super easy it's still very easy um but there's there's the the interacting with people and colleagues on on the kind of in-person level that that I'm and and a lot of people I talk to are like are missing like that's it's like I don't think anyone thought working from home was hard, but I, I think people maybe didn't appreciate as much um, what kind of like office culture brings, which is like, you know, people. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> I have to say that in our office, we were uh, kind of ready to start working remotely because we uh, we already have all the Trello and all these things. Um, um, uh, and uh, also, also uh, we do. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, um, we we um, use all the tasking systems and and we communicate on chat even even when we are in the same room. We we do that uh, just to to make a proper documentation of, of every project. So so we were pretty ready to start working remotely, but eventually we didn't. We are such a small small group of people that it's uh, probably not dangerous to meet. Uh, for for a month or so, we were not meeting at all, 
Uh, but for me, it's difficult to, to work from home because my setup at home is not really good for, for office work. So, so I cannot work from home. And um, it's also hard having your bed so close, yeah? <laughs> also that. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> my, 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 my domestic setup is like, I cannot have it. That, that, that's it. Uh, of what I wanted to say. So, so uh, for me, uh, for a month, I, I literally stopped working uh, and uh, we were just occasionally um, just broadcasting a podcast that just we yeah. wanted to, to stay together uh, somehow. But the colleagues, they were still going to the office because, because it was difficult eventually for us to, to work remotely, even though we, we are technically, we are completely ready. Uh, and there is no need to meet in person, but we still, still, still have to. But also, also I have to mention that here the pandemic wasn't wasn't that uh, that horrible at all. So um, we've got uh, unfortunately we do have some some uh, people who died from from COVID, but it was just twenty eight people. So it's not yeah. uh, it's not so bad here. Like I'm in Portland, Oregon, so it's it's not so bad. But you know, places like New York or which yeah. I was previously, I was kind of happy I wasn't there during all this. Uh, yeah. You know, it, like, you know, the U.S. is so big, so um, it's a little misleading when you see the numbers because it, it's really like if you wanted to compare it, it should be like all of Europe compared because it's like all of our states are like. But there is like per capita or per uh, 1,000 uh, people. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. It's still high in the U.S. It's still high. We yeah, yeah through... for sure, because the, the, like, like New York got hit like super, super bad. Uh, California, Seattle, now Florida, um, you know, like it, there's these like s specific states that like it, it just goes from like one state to the other, but they're, they're like the, you know, the, the popular like almost tourist states, you know, and it kind of, it's kind of obvious to know which states are going to get hit like that. And it's all the, the ones you would expect, New York, California, I mean, it's, <laughs> The popular, the popular kids are now. Well, oh, it's where everyone's mixed. Everyone's traveling. Everyone's moving around all the time. Everyone's living very close together. Um, you know, so you you can't even you know be in your home without going down an elevator with you know ten other people. You know, so. <laughs> So uh, did you respond to to the situation with uh, some sort of design or something? Did you do anything? Uh, for me, I mean, I mostly just been been like focusing on my work, like at, like uh, in the in the beginning of it, I worked uh, on like pufferfish. Um, we already had had webinars set up before, so um, like we didn't set up any in a reactionary state. Like they were already set up. Um, we were doing them anyway, um, and we actually finished a workshop right as Italy was getting locked down. Um, and actually a few students um, had to cancel because their country wouldn't let them travel like right at that week. Um, so like right at the tail end, we had a, a our last physical workshop uh, for them. Um, and other than that, it was just been my like work at Nike and, you know, cause I have to, you know, focus on the, for sure. The career part of stuff so cool uh let's uh let's now um make the real talk about um about the plugins in grasshopper because actually, yeah. actually that was the that was the main topic that's why why <laughs> approach me like okay come on we've got yeah. plugins and um I, I gave a workshop um uh tutorial today uh, so i was not only talking about the event that, that we organized but also uh, I was planning in this uh, afternoon session, this is afternoon session for us, yeah, of course not for you, but uh, I was planning to, to give a tutorial where I was about to show uh, that you can actually, you don't have to use my void library to actually achieve the same thing because you can use Vanilla Grasshopper plus Animoon to, to actually um, do the same stuff. And I was encouraging people to, to when they can, uh, just to use Vanilla because then uh, they understand they, they have a better understanding uh, of the principles and also of the design process that, that they are actually um, going through. So um, maybe I, I believe that uh, your, your take on this is different. Your opinion might be different. So. Well, 
I think it's not so different, um, but it's just, I guess, maybe not so like one or the other. For me, it's like, um, like there's a lot of stuff in Pufferfish uh, and any plugin really. You, if you really tried hard enough, you can do it without the plugin. Um, it just depends like how, how hard you want to try. I mean, there's some stuff in Pufferfish that are like so stupid um, that you don't need them, but like, you know, Pufferfish, like I was telling you yesterday was like, it, it was honestly like a super selfish plugin because I made it for two reasons. The, the first reason was like to force myself to learn to code. Uh, and the only way really to learn to code is to do something. Otherwise you're just like aimlessly copying codes. Um, and the second reason was because after the amount of time we've been using Grasshopper, um, it's just laziness. Like I just got tired of doing, connecting the same components together and this and that. Um, so there, there's some stuff there that I was just like, like for the, the, the funniest, stupidest one I could think of is like x minus one right i just got so sick and tired of typing x minus one like or or putting minus one in x and and there's just like stupid stuff like that because how many times do you need that in coding a lot of times right you you need that so many times i got tired of typing it so there's that end of it but then there's the more like the more advanced end of it which is like something like the like the mirror cutting or something like that, which which actually takes a lot um, of understanding of like meshes and vertice orders and connectivity. Um, and again, like I would say 95% of plugins you can do in Grasshopper. Um, some like 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 anemone, like you, you would you would have to use that unless you're unless you're scripting. Like it's one or the other, right? Like because you, you, you can't do it any other way. Um, so that's like one end of it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say there there's some things that I personally just wouldn't do um, in Grasshopper that are in Powerfish because they would probably be like hundreds of stupid components. Um, but I would say like if you're if you're learning, like you you should not use them. I mean there was like not many plugins when we were started learning. Um, and that many didn't even exist, you know. <laughs> I actually remember talking to to Mateo. She was showing me the first version, and I really insisted to <clears throat> to add the trigger uh, as an input. Like, yeah. oh, you don't need it. I was like, I, I absolutely need it. So so he <laughs> the trigger, and now I realize that I really don't need it. And yeah, I never used the trigger. <laughs> it's there because of me. Uh, yeah. I, I insisted, and Mateo was like, Yeah, whatever. I will I will leave it there for you. And it's <laughs> there, and you don't need it. <laughs> so, yeah. But I'm not a I'm not opposed. I mean, it just really depends. Like, are you just trying to use something? I feel like in the mindset I'm at now, like, uh, I know Grasshopper. Like, I, I don't need to learn it. Like the, you know, where I think we're at the point where like we, we just focus on like now what what do you do with it? Like, what do you design? But when I'm using Grasshopper, I I'm very rarely think about like how to use Grasshopper. It's it's just like at some point it just becomes like. It's just easy, right? It's just like, because you just have done it so much. Like I, I, I never think about data trees or this, that. It's just like, you're just used to it. Um, but it, like, if you're just learning, it, it makes sense to try to learn the hard way before you go the lazy way. So I, I'm, I'm in the point now, like if I had to make some, some voids, you know, I could do it, but if your thing's already there, I'm just going to use that because I don't feel like remaking it. <laughs> oh, I need to. I need to attempt to pull it. <laughs> or I need to. I need to return back and maybe at least give it proper names because I just miss. I just yeah. it's such a broken English that I use there. I mean, I use it sometimes. Yeah. I haven't in a while, but I I use it sometimes. That's that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Like, if you already know the stuff, just then like just. If it exists and it works well, that's the other thing. Is 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 like, can you trust the plugin? Like, you know, is it? And I actually realized that sometimes you cannot uh, trust even vanilla grasshopper. Uh, no, you know, yeah. there are some components now that uh, work in parallel, and they completely break the order of, of the list. Yeah. And it's like, oh come on! And until I realized that, 
Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you cannot trust anything. Well, I think that that's something that a lot of people misunderstand is that like th there's actually no difference between Grasshopper and plugins. They're made, they're made like the same way. The components in Grasshopper, I mean, they're actually .gha libraries. They're made in a similar way using a template. So there's there's not much a difference. There, there is. There, I think there is a crucial difference that when uh, something is um, is a production software uh, and there is a company behind and some sort of support and some sort of processes uh, streamlined, then probably what somebody made there was reviewed by somebody else. Uh, yeah. Whereas the plugin can be done with just by one person without any any sort of uh, quality check. Yeah, that's the difference. Is like the 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 experience of the person and you can like more trust the person that's at the company like you know Rutten, right like you know he's he's doing with like he knows what he's doing yeah. um but everyone makes bugs and mistakes and he that's has important. them too and he you know so <laughs> we're humans I'm not really complaining <laughs> about the mistakes i just i was just thinking now that when we were uh, now developing a software uh, we spent most of the time all on the reviews. So whatever mm. thing I, I did, but because we were three people, two uh, proper programmers and myself, whatever stupid thing I did, it took a month until it was merged into into the uh, the entire project because they didn't like when they were reviewing what what, what I did. They didn't like it, and um, it makes sense because it wasn't done uh, properly. Uh, but if it, when, when I was doing my my super tiny plugin, there was nobody to check. If, if that yeah, works. for sure. I thought, although I think you, you were sending it to me and Mateusz at some point, yeah. if I remember. There is there is still there is still a, a private Facebook group for for the library. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for in in my, yeah, I mean it's the same for me. I'm I, I think I'm just I'm just a bit lucky now because it has a lot of users and so. Um, if something's not working, I hear about it pretty quickly. Um, or if something should be a different way, uh, I hear about it pretty quickly. Um, and the, the way I decide to like change things or update things or fix things is like, are a lot of people saying that. And, you know, sometimes you'll get like 10 or more people complaining about the same thing, then, you know, you know, it's a problem. <laughs> um, because it's very easy to be like, in your own, it, it's hard to always think about like how the user wants to use stuff. Um, and like I said, like for my plugin, and I'm sure for you, like I was the user, right? Like so, it, I made it for the way I want to work, and then people just happen to like to use it. I mean, I I wasn't planning like if I was planning on this grand thing that people are use, I would charge money for it, you know. <laughs> so so I, I just wanted to simplify like my own workflow um and i thought like well if someone finds it useful that's great if not that's okay too you know whatever um and for me it was like always checking with people like like uh stashik or mateos and um you know these guys were like huge helps and there's like a bunch of other people like credited there you know that's the other thing too like crediting people right like so um i think it's something we don't see enough in the kind of plugin community um, as well is like, if you take something like you should credit the person and ask them, I think too, you know, like I have stuff from, uh, I have one, one component that uses something from Piker, but like deep within the code. Um, it's not like a duplicate of his component. I just needed, uh, it was a, um, a quaternion orientation thing, which he has an actual component for. I use it internal for some rotation thing. Um, you would never even know it's there, but I still reached out to Daniel. I was like, hey, can I use this? He said, okay. He didn't even want to be credited. I credited him anyway. Um, yeah, so just stuff like that too is just, I think, good to do. All right, yeah. Yeah, we are also, um, yeah, whatever we do, we are always crediting, crediting people. We even had, um, uh, it's a different situation, but we even uh, set up, um, something we called a lab, which is, um, which were actually workshops. I'm, I'm going back to, to, to our uh, chit chat about, uh, about the, the workshops, but um, long after you, you were part of this, uh, we got a KUKA robot and um, we, we thought, okay, this is uh, just a waste uh, to, to use it for ourselves. 
and we should invite keep inviting people to, to actually do something with the with the robot but you don't want to, to, to just make um, a, an essential basic uh, tutorial for for the robot all the time so uh, bringing new students and, and teaching them mm -hmm. how to how to, to properly move the robot. So we, we decided to do it differently and we kept inviting uh, people who already have some, some idea how to use the robot and then um, the participants of the workshop, they, they were somehow part of the, the research group. And um, then when we, we, we promised everybody that we'll always credit all of you uh, as, as um, contributors or authors of, of uh, yeah. the research that you were, you were doing with the, with the tutor, so we eventually had <clears throat> um, like a group of 15 people plus the tutor plus uh, us, the organizers, and we promised everybody that we will um, credit everybody, everyone. So whenever we were posting on Facebook, where, where, whenever we were putting something in a catalog, there was a list of 20 people like <laughs> as contributors. So yeah. sometimes it backfires. <laughs> yeah, it's it's hard. Like yeah, that's that's the hard part. It's like when you have to make when a lot of people are involved and you have to make like social media posts and you have to like remember everyone's tag. And then I, I always like forget one or like, you know, it's just like, then I have to like go back and delete it and put another one. And, um, but, but for the, um, the, you know, for, for the, the, the kind of plugin talk, um, I would say use plugins if you understand what they're doing and you so then it's it's like okay for you because if i use a plugin like um I, I just remember like when i was learning plugin like i use something like millipede let's say like it does a lot of cool stuff out of the box but before i understood it i was just limited to making like the same cube iso mesh you know because i didn't understand it <laughs> I actually never uh, managed to understand Millipede, although they published um, like a paper uh, for, for, for that, uh, which was not only a manual, but it was it was a proper some sort of study or something. Uh, I actually don't know who made it. Do, do you know the people? I don't uh, know. Yes, I just can't pronounce his name because it's a lot of letters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, and I'm not even going to attempt it. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, anyway, I think it was some sort of a PhD or something that's Millipede. And you can also see it with the, in the paper, but it's unfinished. And I was trying to read it through and understand, and I never managed because because there is no no proper documentation, or at least I couldn't find it. I think they're at Autodesk now, if I understand correctly. Yeah, I, I, I think I've heard so. But anyway, yeah. my question I mean, is that's that what happens, right? You join like a corporation, and then the, the the side project gets axed, you know. So that's that's why you, you actually the side project well actually no that's a good point uh, also on why not to only rely on plugins because you never know when the developer is gonna stop doing it disappear take it away and then and then you're you know like if you don't understand what was taken away you can't make it or like get that functionality back you know um, whereas like you know plain grasshopper grasshopper it's not going away right it's like it's part of it might change, but it's it's part of that software package. Uh, back to me, uh, to not Millipede, to, to Pufferfish, sorry. Uh, speaking of Pufferfish, are you uh, are you actually making some documentation for that? Is there? Is so there my doc my documentation is all um, Grasshopper uh, files, um, and I I did it in a way. <laughs> so you know when I first made it, I got a lot of emails about questions. So basically what I did was I just made an example for every single component and then larger examples. And since then, I don't get any emails anymore. <laughs> um, do, you, do, you, do you have the source code online? Is it, is it open source? I don't have it online. Um, and it's not for any reason other than I think a lot of it needs like cleaning up uh, not optimization wise, but like just legibility and, and breaking it out more into like methods because some stuff I, I just like wrote all the way through. Like I didn't really think about like method, the method stuff. And like I go through sometimes and try to like, and, and kind of refactor and break them, break them up. But um, it's not nearly as clean as it, I think it should be to go on like something like GitHub or something like that. Um, 
it's something I, I've been talking about uh, a lot, um, where Stashic might also get involved <laughs> uh, to to like as a collaborative co effort um, to move it more also into like things like multi threading and and uh, it, it it has a lot of uh, multi-threaded stuff recently I've been doing it more but like the older stuff I, I just you know that that's the other thing too is a lot of the stuff doesn't happen at the same time so there's like different versions of my experience in the plugin like some older components are like way in code like worse than the newer ones because as I learn more <laughs> so um, but it's hard to go back and fix 300 something components every time you learn something new <laughs> yeah it's um with a with a tech startups and software startups it, it's always like that that you <clears throat> that they make the first version in in two months and in two months it works and it's, it's awesome and it, it's promising and so on and then they realize that they need to scale, they need to make it bigger. And they realize they need to refactor it to actually still, when they, when they grow, that it still holds together. And the refactoring takes two years, even though the first version took uh, two months. Yeah. And that's yeah, the, a pretty interesting thing. I, I mean, I find that that takes me the longest as well. Um, and it's also the, the, less, the least motivating part because it's not interesting to me because I'm not doing new stuff, you know? It's like, it's like cleanup, right? Like, like how interesting do you find cleaning up your house? You know, not, not so interesting. <laughs> um, so it, it's hard to like really focus and say, I'm going to put all of this, especially when you're just by yourself, you know, like I'm going to put all of this time into cleaning this up. And honestly, like no one's even going to notice the effort, right? Because it's all behind the scene and to them, it just looks the same, right? So did you have a pause like did you did you uh, take a break from developing it for like i don't know two months or so or are you doing yeah it? no i i always i always take a breaks uh you know it, it goes like two three months was it easy Between. for you to come back even though you're not doing the cleanup it depends like what it depends like if uh, sometimes I, I i just i do a version and then i'm just like okay i'm good and again i got to do you know, I go on to other stuff, you know, I have my, my, my day job and other ventures. Um, but sometimes, you know, it, it just depends. I'll just wake up and be like, I have a bunch of stuff I want to add, you know, and it, um, you know, I'm, I'm always making a list like that I'm doing often, um, usually like in my, in my phone, in the notes, you know, um, and then once this list gets big enough uh, and I feel a bit overwhelmed, I, I start making <laughs> Um, so that's, that's mostly, and it, it comes in like chunks, like, uh, you know, one chunk was like all the twisted box stuff or another chunk was like all the mirror cutting stuff. It's, it's like a group of ideas at the moment, usually. Um, so it just depends like what's my next idea chunk that I try to fit into the theme which is like blending and, and morphs because that's, you know, tweening, that's like the main theme. Um, so the next kind of idea I have in that theme that I have a good enough idea about, uh, then I'll try to, to put it in there. Other than that, it will just be like optimization stuff. When you, when you put together um, a grasshopper definition, uh, whether you're using Fish or not, uh, do you somehow organize the, the, the content? Do you, do you leave notes um, to yourself or? Oh yeah, all the time because I'll, I'll, I'll forget completely what I did. <laughs> um, the time and I realized that I need to find a, a better way how to organize it better because I just realized that either I, I finish the, the definition in one session or I forget. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I do the definite, basically what I, what usually happens with me is I just do the, the definition all the way through. Then I go through and simplify because the first time I do it is usually fast and messy. And I do a lot of bad practices like copying and pasting instead of stuff like that. Then I go through and I, you know, make sure the data trees and this and that is simplified. And then I just like group things by like, like, you know, 
couple components, like what they're doing, and I just label it just so I remember um, what I'm doing. Um, and and like I just like color for like reference reference like parameters different and sliders different, and then um, any value that I use that isn't meant to be a slider usually use a panel this way. I know there's a value because um, you could, you know, you can just write it in the, in the input, but I, I don't like to forget it. I like to see it. Um, but if it's for me, like if it's a panel it means like I shouldn't change it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, stuff like that. Yeah. But, but I definitely like, it definitely doesn't happen once. There's usually like, I would say like three, versions of each which is like the first version then like the simplified version and then like the, the annotated version um, and it's the same with like the scripting too like I you know I annotate a lot too because I'll forget what I did also so <laughs> yeah no I know how to do it in the in the in the code uh, yeah. there are great ways of, of making making commands and annotations and also uh, when you're using the version control the git um, you can do a lot of interesting stuff over there because you, you, you yeah. can do request reviews and, and you keep track of, of everything and you can command everything. But then, for, at least for me, it's kind of an annoying part of, of doing Grasshopper. It's just like making dimensions into, into blueprints. That, that part I always hated. So. Yeah, it's weird that you have to leave yourself notes. <laughs> but it's, you know, like if you just open it, it all looks the same. You know, like it's just wires all over the place yes. although although my i also tend to work with definitions um i don't know my my definitions always end up being like pretty small actually i think i think you're doing something pretty wrong if your definition is like thousands of components <laughs> it's just my opinion like it should just be broken out into different processes or something because e even if you have that many like even if it's just doing simple math it's just slow right the draw the draw canvas is just slow so um yeah I, I i just i never understood why people's definitions were so big because i've done a lot of very complex stuff and i've never had um, a definition that looked like these crazy spaghetti monster messes you know i think i think the thing is that uh, it depends whether you do it for yourself or for somebody else. Uh, if you do stuff for somebody else, then you probably want to give uh, a whole package. Just these are the inputs, these are the sliders, and these, this is the output, and then it's probably quite huge. But then, on the other hand, it's always dangerous to give out your definition to somebody who, is, who hasn't done it, and, and they just change one little thing, and they completely break yeah. it. They can never find the... the <laughs> Yeah. Whereas yeah. When, when you when you break it into parts, uh, then it's probably just good for you, uh, and you need to open several grasshopper definitions to actually achieve yeah. one thing. So uh, yeah, we all also sometimes end up doing something like well, when I look at the, the definitions, sometimes they are huge, really. Also, but even like breaking it, if you, if you want to break it apart on the same canvas, just like so, it's yeah. just more logically like blocks of code instead of just like a big mass <laughs> the hidden wires no i don't use them though it's, it's it's super annoying to select them one by one just i started recently where, where it makes sense but it's super annoying to do that but then the uh, definition looks really neat yeah with meta hopper you can do it like pretty easily multiple now we are back at plugins yeah <laughs> but I mean, yeah, well, MetaHopper is one of those ones that, like, if you want to be organized, that's a good one. Uh, but, like, like especially I like in MetaHopper the, um, the button that, like, can enable or disable anything in the same group. So you can just, like, press a button and, like, enable, disable an entire group of components. Um, but, but in terms of, like, hidden wires i just don't use them because i i just find it hard to remember where things are going yeah, yeah. Um, so that's just that's just my my preference or the faint wires i think even bother me more <laughs> well, i've never used those <laughs> yeah 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 so. is there anything with grasshopper that you would really wish was was different uh 
Um, I don't know. I, I mean, I guess I like I find things as I'm using it, and that, that and usually ends up being a lot of the stuff that I make, right? Uh, but in terms of like, in terms of the interface, I mean, I know like David's making a lot of stuff, right? He's like, if you watch the Grasshopper Two uh, stuff, um, a lot of like UI stuff seems better. Um, I think like, you know, in the current Grasshopper, like all the graph stuff is so powerful, but so hard to use mm -hmm. in an accurate way, um, which it seems he's making it like much more accurate. Um, I hate, I mean, just the way, like dealing with lists, I think is annoying, um, like complex lists, because I hate using the path mapper um, because the, the, the stupid thing always breaks when you change something. Um, you know, I've started uh, recently using um, uh, the replace uh, path component and yeah. I'm all the meta stuff on, on data trees and it's super powerful and that doesn't break because um, yeah. you actually can deal with uh, like different depths of, of, of trees, even if it changes over time. It can yeah. deal with it and it's super powerful and, and Occasionally, I just realized that I'm not dealing with geometry at all. I'm just reorganizing data trees um, yeah. and stuff. And then eventually everything comes together. I'm, I'm, mostly what I do right now is just, just reorganizing numbers and indices and, yeah. and branches. And that's kind of powerful. So if you are into, into that, maybe just don't use path, path mapper. I, I never use that in, in, in a real project. But replace branch and, and tree statistics and these things are super powerful. Yeah, path mapper is like, yeah, I mean, it's like using a hammer for a screw, you know, it's like, it's it's so heavy handed, like, because again, it's so inflexible, it, it's more than likely going to break with any kind of down, uh, downstream change, or upstream, I don't know, <laughs> left stream. <laughs> uh, um, but yeah, I mean, that that's the other thing why, like, at some point, I think it's valuable to learn coding, because <laughs> Honestly, when I get into like a tricky path problem, I just, I just loop it. You know, it's just so much easier to just iterate. So do I, we use the Yeah, yeah, but even just writing a, a simple C-sharp loop is so, it's so easy what like five lines of codes can do compared to like 16 tossing paths around. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But 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 now I was uh, I was programming a lot in in Rust because our uh, programmer here he he really promotes the, that as a as a great programming language and it is and it's super uh, difficult for me. But the thing is that sometimes when he is reviewing my stuff, he's like, okay, you're using the functional programming that you learned from Grasshopper again. So so I'm using the Grasshopper logic even when I'm writing the code and and it somehow gets got so much under my skin that it's more natural than writing a for loop. I basically yeah. you, can, you can do very similar stuff and and encode as well. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. And he's not really able to read it after me or willing <laughs> yeah. to read it after me. Uh, because it's, it it looks messy in the code and it looks kind of okay uh, with with Grasshopper. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I I'm just yeah, like loops. I I wish actually I, I think one thing that would be nice in Grasshopper is if there was an option to have. Um, like branch addresses pay more attention to each other because right now like when you match you know when you match data trees they don't really care the addresses don't care about each other only oh, yeah. only the order of the addresses yeah. like it's, a it's literally a string and and yeah matching the first string with this with the first string and, and second with the second yeah. but but a lot of times you want like the addresses that start with zero to match with the address start with zero, the address start with one to match with one. That's what, what, what the path, what, what the replace branch is good for. Yeah, yeah. I just wish it, it's, I just wish there was like a, cause you know, like there's like options like, like, uh, like um, principal input. And so like, it just seems like there could. You know what it is. What is it? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I honestly don't know either. <laughs> uh, it, I think, from what I understood, I haven't used it in a long time. I, I think it, it, like when you have, two, when you're matching addresses, I think it decides how the output branch looks. Like, does it take the longer amount of 
paths or the shorter like if you match like zero zero one with like zero 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 one like which one does it look at always the first one like the first input uh, is defining the output yeah i think so and maybe you can switch it from, from i the... think prin principle i think lets you decide which one from yeah. what i understood but it's not it doesn't really do anything different it just looks different it doesn't really change the functionality but it, it just seems like there could be an option to to look more carefully at those uh those addresses instead of just caring about the order. So, um, but I don't run into these problems. I mean, when you use this grasshopper so much, you don't really run into these problems. Uh, so somehow I started to, to rely on the same components over and over, and there are some components that I'm never using. Like yeah. uh, uh, there is this um, numerical input where you can just, just like change numbers vertically, not horizontally, like in Slider. I don't know what. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I, I think yeah. Um, oh, the the digital the did the yeah yeah. It's like a rolling. Yeah, it's a number. Frame sl slider in a way, and yeah. I just st started using them because I was I was like, okay, this makes sense that you don't really need to define the the, the domain of the of the slider, yeah. and I stopped because it, it doesn't really make much sense. Oh, you have like knobs and stuff like that. Yeah, <laughs> they look, <laughs> they look cool. Yeah. Have you ever used um, uh, the data dam or or the I don't know the switch that that, that switch? Yeah, the, the I use yeah I definitely use it. Um, I use it when I have. Uh, I actually find myself using it a lot after Kangaroo, like after the output of Kangaroo, um, because if I accidentally like hit the um if i accidentally hit like to restart kangaroo or i hit the button i i might get a different so you know like depends how long you let some solutions run i might accidentally hit that and get a different solution and be like oh, i can't get that solution i had back so at least it's in like the dam and i can like bake it out or internalize it somewhere <laughs> what about a timer uh, I don't use no. I don't. I don't use a timer so much no. Because again, like anything like that, I'll I'll just use like a loop or an anemone or, um, you know. It seems like um, at the beginning it wasn't clear how grasshopper is going to be used, and these are things that eventually seem uh, a little bit out of the system, um, and they remain because why not? But it seems like this is not really uh, how grasshopper is meant to work timer and stuff uh, so i don't know i mean he made the timer right so <laughs> um <laughs> i don't know what their plans are for for the with for like grasshopper 2 or when that will even happen you know but i assume there'll be a lot of optimizations i hope and and good stuff you know what you know there are some things that just could be more updated but also it's interesting that Grasshopper really hasn't been updated much since 2012, except for like some new components. And it's still like, I think the, the, the top used node editing for modeling, um, which I think says a lot about how no, user-friendly it is. Thing. It's user-friendly and, and it's doing um, many things right. Like, uh, that it's uh, executing automatically, and you can you can see the results in, in each node. That's very important. Also, uh, the immutability it doesn't change your uh, geometry ever. Yeah, it always makes a copy. That's an awesome thing. And also that it's it's probably based on Haskell, I, I believe. So like it's the the functional programming paradigm there uh, is just uh, that's a great thing for for data processing like like uh, Grasshopper is doing. And I think. Uh, he got it completely right, and yeah. um, when I was just trying Dynamo once in my life, and it looked, <laughs> they got it wrong. Yeah, I, I I'm, I'm super happy I don't have to use Revit or Dynamo anymore. <laughs> I don't know, I, I never had to, I was just curious, and it, I was like, yeah. it looks similar, but it's not. It's no. Speaking of which, uh, is there anything else that you use uh, aside of Prosper? Oh yeah, I, I I use I use so much software. I mean, the the thing is is like 
you know, for me, it's just to always to keep in mind, like using the right tool for the right job, you know, like Grasshopper doesn't solve everything. It's, it's by far like my favorite to work in, but it's not the, it's not the best or even needs to be the best at a lot of things. Um, Cause it's like the software doesn't need to do everything. Like one software doesn't need to do everything. Um, it, like I, we were talking about this briefly yesterday, you know, it's like, if, if I have to do like a, you were doing this like voxel thing yesterday, like, like, sure, you can do that in Grasshopper, but when, when it comes to, like, the point where you really need, like, a billion polygon faces, like, no matter how optimal your code is, it's just, like, Rhino's just not the place to do that, you know? So you just have to know. Like, for me, I I'll, I'll might go into ZBrush or something like that, you know, because it can handle that, like, like it's nothing, you know? So um, just knowing, like, the right tool um, for me, it's mainly like everyday use um, is is Rhino, Grasshopper, Maya, and ZBrush, um, and a few other um, like mesh softwares. Um, so, um, yeah, definitely, definitely those. And then, like, if I need something special, uh, sometimes there's Houdini. Like some things, it does, you know. Um, better or faster. It's also really good at handling those super dense mesh mesh objects. So um, yeah, it, it just depends on like what you need. Yeah. Houdini seems like something that we should have a better look into. I, I'm just way too lazy to, to learn. It's not as it's not as organized. It's not organized as well. It's definitely like a, it, it definitely takes a more I mean, for you, it, it wouldn't be difficult. It, it definitely takes a more advanced understanding of things because there's a lot of, there are, a, it's heavily scripting based too. Like you have to like script into things like, um, um, cause all the components are kind of like, you can manipulate them in ways like that. Um, the nice thing about Houdini is like the, the, the entire processes gets multi-threaded um, like without you doing anything, it's just like what happens. So that's one reason why it's fast. And then it's using OpenVDB for the meshes, um, and it's using uh, volumetric meshes, uh, like volumetrics, which instead of meshes, uh, like as we know them, um, which I'm sure you know, it's from uh, is I think it's from DreamWorks that makes OpenVDB, something like that. I don't know. So these these very these companies that spend billions of dollars on these things so <laughs> so of course it's going to be really good uh, because they have to make these movies you know uh, so I, I think yeah I think it, it's not as easy as Grasshopper uh, especially if you don't know a bit of scripting and the thing is that um, as far as I understood David he said that he made Grasshopper to actually make um, for, for people to, to design a more meaningful architecture or smart architecture. So, so we need to go back to, to the main purpose. The idea was to not to use it with meshes and to, to create all the crazy shapes that we all do, but just to, to make smarter buildings. And it makes sense that it, it mainly works with curves and, and nerves um, mm. because, because that's a very exact geometry that you can then uh, process uh, with machines and, and make blueprints and make people build stuff. So, so kind of it, it kind of makes sense that it's using mainly NURBS and it's not really oriented on, on meshes. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you just have to know what this, I mean, isn't, isn't Rhino's tagline like NURBS modeling software or something like that? It's not anymore. Uh, it used yeah. to be with uh, the, the previous one or two versions. Now it's something else I can, I can run it. But, no, I don't but, think. But anyway, like just knowing, like again, like just knowing what's, what's best used for what like i'm not trying to spend like hours and hours doing something in grasshopper that i can do in a few minutes in some other software uh, it, it just you know it just is what it is and and it's just weird to me when i see like on the forums people like why can't rhino have these features that revit has well it's not bim software like Right, Revit is for architecture, but Rhino's not for architecture. It's for 3D modeling. It's not 
you know, ar architects use it, but it's not trying to be an architect soft only software. Because then if you specialize that, it's like, well, then you're going to make all this BIM stuff there. And then you're going to have the boat guys like, well, where's our boat tools? And then you're going to have the shoe guys like, where's our shoe tools? And so, you know, it's not trying to be that, you know, so it, it's just weird that people want that. You know, I don't know. I understand the frustration. I remember it when I was learning uh, Grasshopera and Rhino, it seemed like it's missing really basic things that I, I, I knew from other software and I couldn't understand, but that comes with, um, with experience. You, you start realizing that uh, this is based on some different notions and different ideas. As you said, it's not meant to, to substitute everything, uh, but I understand the complaints because, because there's always something that is super comfortable in any software, pick anything, including AutoCAD. There is something that is really comfortable there. But, and you cannot find it in Rhino, and you are, you're like, okay, yeah. so it's a step back, but eventually um, it's all about like, yeah, she should use uh, proper software for each uh, task. And also, also you need to understand what the tool is so that you use it properly uh, and not expect something that it's not. Yeah, like, a, like a, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to make like a parametric facade in ZBrush, you know? So, <laughs> I mean, you just have to know what, what you're trying to do. Uh, I think that a lot of this kind of questions come from people trying to skip a lot of steps and, and not, not knowing what they want to do. You know, like it's very hard even for me to use Grasshopper if I don't know what I'm trying to do with it. Um, then I'm just like plugging stuff, even like the random stuff I do, I, I try to have some idea of like what I'm trying to do at least. Uh, and that and that's why you end up with like Voronoi facades, right? Because- Oh, you know, we, we made a Voronoi, <laughs> soft, uh, Voronoi project recently. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's okay. I mean, but but that's why you see it so much from like students because it's it it's like a prepackaged thing and they don't have to learn anything. And it's, 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 very easily visually interesting like automatically it's automatically visually interesting um as much as so as we component that, that already does uh, makes a result yeah exactly and and um you know like i i use voronoi all the time but not for like visual effect you know like um just just the way it's a, a, a really great way to like separate things and and zone make things zonal or or capture something in a specific region or medial axis stuff like that it's, because that's what it is actually it's a diagram yeah. that, that is equally yeah. uh dividing a space into into lots and that's that's uh essentially what we started talking about that you should understand your tool to actually use it uh wisely yeah, yeah. well they, again like that's like i was saying with millipede like if you don't if you don't like if you want to use that tool or you have something to do with that tool and you don't invest the time in understanding it, like we may not have or may have, um, you end up basically just making what's on their like website as the promotional images, which is like the basic cube ISO mesh, you know, um, which I've done too. I mean, this looks cool, right? But it doesn't really mean that. I, I did that too, but then I was very frustrated that I don't know how, th that I don't know how to move it further, so I stopped. And there's, <laughs> there are other plugins now that do very similar stuff. Uh, there's one yeah. called Topos. I, I still didn't have time to, to have a look so at Topos. I think, I mean, yeah. I mean, you can, you can do it with like Monolith, like voxelize the, yeah. um, stuff like that. So. Doing the, uh, it's also voxelizing, I think. Actually. Yeah. Voxels are actually super powerful if you if you think about the mathematical representation of what they are. They basically there is always a scalar field behind some some field of values behind that are distributed in the space, and that's uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean fields and like ISOs and scalars, like the, all that stuff is is really the most powerful. But it's also like I think it's like such an abstract concept that um, I think people stop at the visual interest of it um, without really knowing like you can do some really good stuff with it that doesn't look so interesting but solves a lot of problems.
This is this is an issue that we are. I'm personally having a, a lot that um, I spend some time doing something, and I really believe that it's a valuable thing, and eventually it doesn't look so good, and it's. I don't know how to promote that stuff. Uh, and also uh, for me myself, I, I, I stopped liking it because it doesn't look good. So the combination of making something that is conceptually valuable or, or is uh, somehow pushing the limits and making it looking good, that's the hard part. Yeah, it's also hard. Like I do so many things in Pufferfish that I'm just like, this is so good, but no one's going to appreciate this you know like no one is really going to appreciate what's going on here <laughs> maybe you can promote those things now you can you can talk about those things that people should appreciate more yeah it's it's there's yeah i mean there's just there's just some things that like work and and i think there's a loss of appreciation for like how well they work and even verse other similar components that look like they do the same thing but in fact are not as good even in like how fast they execute or you know like there's there's like a cleverness in them that you know like it's <laughs> um you know like you can write like le like just a stupid example like the the points in curves um is kind of slow component but you can write that component um, as just turning the curve regions into meshes and then shooting mesh rays from your points to see if they hit and you get the exact same results and it's like a thousand times faster even than than rhino commons method rhino commons method pointing curves is like the one in grasshopper it's kind of slow it's doing a lot of technical stuff but honestly like just making the curves into meshes and shooting rays from your points down is like just as good and so much faster um but then you know i wonder like and i i actually use that method in some of my components and it's like i don't think anyone will appreciate <laughs> these kind of things that happen behind the scenes to to make things work better or faster or smarter or more organized you know so um yeah, th those are like the fun things to me, but I've always just like, sometimes I'll work like days on like some stupid feature like that. That This is everybody <laughs> who's creating something, it's software developers, the programmers that know it, but also as an architect, you know yeah. that you, you spend a lot of time on something that is really invisible. And you know, yeah. it's kind of important for you, but uh, still invisible and doesn't matter so much. Yeah, we, yeah. we all know that. Yeah, it's like it's like the the door handles of a of a of a building, right? Like, if someone really notices, it could have like the most amazing door handle detail you've ever seen in your life. But probably no one even notices. You know, the most embarrassing part is when you need to take the person to that door handle and show this is this is the good part of my building. And it happens to me all the time. Like somebody comes and and says like. Hmm, what is the thing that you're most proud of? And I have to like, I'm visible by here. And they... Yeah. Or like, you see this, this like bathroom floor, it has not a single cut tile. You yeah. know, like so... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but someone spent like a good amount of time figuring out that, that layout, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, All right. Um, let's ask the the people watching us. Hopefully, they are having a good time, just like we do. Uh, is there <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, but I, I really appreciate. It. I'm I'm so happy that we are making this conversation. It's been a while, and yeah, yeah. it's super embarrassing just sitting in front of the computer talking to it, and I'm hoping that people actually are following and or at least are not feeling like what, what the hell is this guy talking about. Well, when if we not. If not, at least we had a good conversation yeah. between ourselves. <laughs> people on Zoom, and I also see that there are some people on Facebook. So maybe I would like to ask them uh, to, to join us, or um, uh, maybe guys, we want to say something, ask some, something, add something. We You don't have to ask. Uh, you can just join the conversation if you feel like. Just do so. Raise your hand, and I will un unmute you. Maybe you can do it yourself. Or on Facebook, if you're watching us on Facebook, just, just post. Um, Facebook, I hope I will see it. 
Um, I think so. If somebody comments on the video, I, I would, would be able to see it. So Do, yeah. Oh, I guess I have to see it like what on. No, I'm, I'm checking the Facebook. Uh, yeah, now somebody somebody did comment uh, on the video. But because I'm on a very slow computer right now, it takes a while. So maybe somebody on Zoom, is there anyone who would like to say something? Oh, no, there, that's just a, a wave. <laughs> Some wave on Facebook. <laughs> Good. I don't, yeah. Do I guess the comments are like live comments? Is that it, how it works? I don't know. I but don't they're like delayed, right? Behind us or something. Just, just a little bit, not too much. But I think even the live comments, you can you can see them. You can see them. Mm -hmm. their... But nevertheless, um, so anybody on Zoom would like to join in and, and talk to us? No. Let me ask you uh, two more questions before we we finish, and they will be long. So. We are not finishing anytime soon. Um, <laughs> sure. So, um, is there any plans for the future that you would like to share? Something that you would really like to say? Uh, on my end, I mean, I mean, I'm not, I'm not treating, I'm not treating the pandemic as like something I need to react to. Uh, we've always been doing stuff, so I mean, we're just gonna. We're just gonna keep on doing stuff, uh, you know, as as we have. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I mean, I just you know, we've been doing this for a while, just just like you. So it's it doesn't take any extra. Yeah. So there is design morphine. There is pufferfish. There is Nike. Anything yeah. interesting that we can expect, and you can talk about. Uh. Well, I can't really talk about Nike. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to hear any secrets. I, that's why I'm not talking about stuff. Yeah. Like, no, I mean, I, yeah. I want to talk about this. Yeah. I mean, we have some stuff planned, but it's uh, nothing that we can announce now, I'll say. <laughs> um, but as usual, stuff will come, so, as it does. I hope that this will be a longer answer, and because I said we are not going to and anytime soon, but then I've got one, one more thing that I would like to uh, ask you, not, not a question I would like to ask you to do. Um, do you think you can, you can make a very, very quick tutorial now? A or, tutorial on what? Perfect. Or whatever you would like to sh like show. Because, you know, I'm trying, this is the, 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 the entire, like all the six days that I'm talking to the computer and hoping that somebody is interested and hoping that I'm giving some valuable stuff. I decided not to really uh, teach the tooling, uh, although every day I do some, some I, I do some small tutorial, but anytime I'm just talking about stuff, I would really like people to leave with some food for thought or some new knowledge or some new experience that they have. So. Mm, can can we give them some some very quick tutorial or something that you know? Yeah, I mean, I have example files if that works. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> Let, let's uh, see what you can what you can show us. It doesn't have to be long. It just make it make it ten fifteen minutes. Whatever works for you. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm just opening up my uh, my stuff here. I wait, I didn't tell you before. Sorry, but. No, it's okay. I mean, I'll, I'll just, I have the example files like here. So let's just see. I'm going to check the Facebook. Still no question on Facebook. But people are watching, that's pretty good. Maybe they're, maybe they're shy. No, I understand. Like, it's difficult to ask a good question. Oh, there is a, a question in the chat. Um, can you see the question? How is the feeling working uh, in uh, Nike as a as a computational architect? Um, well, I'm not an architect there. Uh, <laughs> um, it's. I mean, it's an awesome job. It's definitely my favorite job. Uh, I feel like 
I feel like I should have been in product design all along. I mean, I really like it a lot. Um, um, to me, in my experience, like the culture is, is great. Um, I think these kind of fields treat you a lot better than architecture does. Uh, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's Maybe much. Maybe we can talk about that because I've got um, a similar experience. Um, yeah. So, so what is the difference? How do you like uh, being there as a, in comparison to like working as an architect at, at an office? Well, I think you're just you're just like in the kind of niche position we're in. Um, you're treated more as a specialist, whereas I think in architecture even if you're called a specialist, it doesn't really mean anything. Like you're still getting the same, you're, you're often getting similar pay, which isn't great. Um, um, that's one thing. Um, I, I think it's just a much more appreciative, um, it, it, uh, I, I mean, I only know, I haven't worked at any other place outside of architecture except for Nike. So, um, but it's very appreciative of like your personal life, um, nine to five, always no weekends. You don't get emails on week. I mean, it, it's, it's just a lot more like respective in my, in my opinion of like being a human, <laughs> you know, um, um, there's, there's this great, you know, the whole work life balance is like a real thing, you know? So, um, and you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're just, it's, it's your life. And like, do you want to spend your whole life in front of a computer doing someone else's work? Probably not. Um, and it, it doesn't really mean anything. I, yeah, it, it's, it's really just the, the kind of culture and their pre appreciation is a lot different. Um, I also find like, at least my, I, I think also people's experience there would be different because it's a huge corporation. So um, with many teams, uh, you're talking like 80,000 employees or something like that, you know, it's a humongous corporation. Um, but my experience is just that, uh, yeah, I mean, you're just treated well and appreciated and the people you work with are also like amazing. And um, one thing I don't miss is the architecture ego, <laughs> you know, like a, a, a lot of people you'll deal with. Um, you know, I don't know, <laughs> as, as we all know, as we all been like architects tend to think they're solving the world's problems, but, <laughs> uh, you know, <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, uh, there... Also, isn't, isn't there, the, there's this kind of weird illusion, like if you ever seen like architects in movies or something, like there's this weird illusion that like architects are like rich somehow like they're making tons of money and they have all this time to and then you see <laughs> then you see that they stand in front of a model that looks like uh an awkward building from early 70s yeah. uh, yes. like, <laughs> so there is a this notion of rich and and certainly the the script writer doesn't know what architects do <laughs> yeah like was it how i met your mother i mean how many times did you actually see this guy work like never <laughs> Back at that series, it was horrible. That was, it, it you, was a really if, bad series, right? If it, if it was real, like he, he would only have been in like two episodes for like 10 <laughs> minutes, and then he'd be going back to the office at 5 a.m. after a drink to finish his uh, deadline or something, you know? No, but the <laughs> they just come to see the model, they, they tweak it on the model a little, they move it a little to the right, and that's done. And then they go back to the bar with their friends, you know, to have some wings. Or... That, there in that series, that he, he had this breakthrough project when he became, uh, he, he believed that he is becoming rich and he was designing a skyscraper. That was yeah. so incredibly ugly when they showed it. It's like, it was just a monolith. Yeah. It was just a. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but... A follow up question. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No. Uh, there's a follow-up question. How, how about the work pressure 
if you can compare, compare working as an architect, I mean, Nike is Nike, you know, dreams and life. That's, I was reading. The what? Um, yeah, the work pressure, if you compare with working as an architect. Yeah. Um, there's, like, if you're good, like, you're, you're good. Like, there's, there's no, there's no, like, um, it, it's a very self, uh, I, I, I guess, you know, you, you, for me, like, I have things I need to do, and I get them done, but it's a very collaborative space. Um, it's not like, um, someone's kind of like always rushing you. Um, but I think I, I've got the same experience also myself and also people I work with. Um, and I think it's the same case for you. We are just older and wiser and, and we can self-motivate. And it's like, we are not, we are not dumb people. Yeah. And, and you know that you need to do your job and you're not avoiding it. And, and if you enjoy it, then, then well, well, the pressure is good for it. Just do your stuff yeah. and you understand that it has to be done. Yeah, I think a lot of, a lot, I mean, a lot of the work is, uh, a lot of the work is just like, uh, it, it's like hanging out with your friends and getting like cool stuff done, you know. Um, I mean, most of my conversations are even like, just like through text message or something. And, you know, like, it's, it's, it's not as, it's more free for sure. Like it, it is what you make of it really. Like how involved you want to be um, or how much you care about the thing you're doing, you know? Um, That's what also I for, for me, it's interesting because I think uh, uh, I have a bit of a short attention span and architecture takes a long time. Um, and the, the, you know, architecture is like, a small percent of the fun stuff and then a large percent of the annoying stuff. So like documenting and dealing with it um, in product design, um, things are so much quicker. Um, and you're always doing multiple things, new things. It's, uh, it's just a, a really nice space. Um, also like per personally for me, um, I, I just got, what I'm interested in, what we're interested in is like computational design and stuff like that. And um, I, I just found my experience with it in outside of academia in the real world is usually like optimizing facades or like daylighting or room layouts, which was just not something I was interested in doing. Um, for some people it is, and, and I have nothing against that. It just wasn't for me. Um, so, um, it just depends what you want to do. Um, for me, it's nice because I, I get to work all the time um, on this 360 degree object that has no straight part and, you know, like just figuring out all these things for like, it's just a different type of problem that, that I personally find interesting um, solving those kind of problems. Like, you know. <laughs> Uh, we've got uh, two more questions. Uh, do you consider yourself an architect or a designer? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, can, I consider myself, I, I would say, a designer. Um, yeah, because, I mean, I'm not doing architecture right now, um, but even when I was in architecture, I was, I was just more into, like, the honestly, like the scripting and tool making and problem solving. Um, but I, I like, I like, um, I like geometrical problems. Like I like the, the result to be something um, visually interesting um, as opposed to uh, like room layout or something, you know, like, like it's just a different type of problem that I like to solve. Uh, there is another question from uh, uh, on Facebook from uh, Daniel Krejci. I will I will just ask it uh, in different words. I hope I, I understood. Uh, the question is, how do you? Um, what is your experience when you want to do uh, computational design uh, in an environment where people don't know it? So, um, uh, or did you were you lucky enough to to work with uh, uh, 
bosses that your boss knew what what you can actually do and what is it good for did, did you struggle to to actually um, convince somebody to to, to to believe that thing in in architecture you mean I well, guess. that's a question. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, in, in Nike, I'm on a computational design team. So like they know what I'm doing. Um, but that's a very important notion too. They, they already know that, that this huge company company knows that there's this thing and it's valuable. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I, I would say every field except architecture. Uh, and I'm talking about architecture outside of academia, like um, values these things a lot a lot a lot higher than than um, architecture as practice does um what is your experience did you have to convince somebody to to actually so i mean in our in in i would say in in architecture like like i never was like this is this thing i did with computational design or this is this thing i did with grasshopper i mean you just like did the thing however i had to do it um if it was with grasshopper or manual or whatever like whatever again like the, this this comes back to like using the right thing for the problem was the was the result uh, so convincing that uh, that uh, somebody who was uh, a decision maker understood that okay this is the solution for the problem was it always the case or because very often we just get excited about the tool and, and how cool it is and well or yeah i mean I just think about like the obvious things like something like a facade, right? Like something you, you can, you can easily visually justify like why something is better or not better through daylight simulation and uh, openings and, and, and whatnot. But the, the issue then comes always in architecture with cost. Um, and it's, it's very hard if not unlikely, um, unless you're in, um, you know, a special, a special office um, that has like, you know, the right kind of clients. Uh, it's very hard to justify that your building is going to have uh, multiple thousand unique panels or so, you know. Um, so there's like a whole level of kind of like standardization um, that could make or break the design or make it not look as good um and then also often there's value engineering right which usually the 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 cool unique stuff is the first to go uh, when things go over budget because they're a luxury they're not necessary <laughs> but i i have to say on the other hand um just back to to the original question uh for us now we were looking for people who would actually know the stuff like we wanted to extend the team and find people who actually can use at least the, the, at least grasshopper um on, on certain level or we prefer other tools or we would like to have people with other, other skills as well but it's difficult to find those people so it's um also i think that in architecture it's it yeah uh, there is no demand from the offices and from the from the employers or not that much demand but when there is they cannot find the people because um the schools are usually not producing people who know the stuff yeah. so it, it's difficult to find there's always one or two people at each school that you can you can select from and they they, they do good and we are lucky that that in our office we do have people that, that either have learned that stuff on their own but or, or we were able to teach them but the education here at least is not sufficient for what we yeah. expect. i think you just shouldn't have like I think you just shouldn't have to convince anyone, right? Because you shouldn't, I think you shouldn't be doing, like you shouldn't be doing grasshopper for grasshopper's sake, right? Like it, it's like whatever, however you arrived at it, like if it's the solution, it's going to be the solution, right? So like it, it's more like convincing, like more time should be spent convincing that the thing is a solution and less about like what made the solution. Right, let's go to the tutorial and uh, because we are slowly running out of time. Yeah. But also importantly, also it's like the, the, the client very rarely cares about that also. Right? 
we're trying to actually uh, explain to our clients that we do things this way and it depends on the client there, there are clients who appreciate just out of the uh, just out of the their interest sometimes it's it, it's sometimes enough that that they actually feel like they've been treated specially and yeah. that's well, a, a yeah. good feeling for us when, when you you have um you have me you have sharing uh, disabled uh well then i need to go to <laughs> to another computer i will somehow do it uh, over there uh let me just uh yeah you will lose me for for a moment okay okay yeah. I think you should be now able to uh, actually share the screen. Let's see here. Can you? Uh, I'm going to try now. Uh, the thing is that, yeah. I think it's working. All right, I'm going back to my original uh, station. Yeah, seems it's working. Are you there? It says you're muted. Yeah, no, I'm back. <laughs> yeah. No, um, because okay. using two computers, you see me twice on a, on on a list of participants. Yeah, I see you there. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have about ten minutes before I have to go into another thing. Uh, so um, I'll I'll just like open some example files. I don't really have time to like make anything new. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, if you're using Puffish or if you haven't yet, uh, just get these example files here. Um, there's tons of stuff there to play with. Um, and you'll see, you'll get two folders. There's a components folder, which has like a example for every tab. Um, and that has like an example for each component in the tab. Um, so if I open up something like uh, like Twisted Box, let's say, oh yeah, I'm this folder here. So you'll see it has like, you know, it's labeled as the component, and then it has like all the explanation. Like so, that's how I was doing the documentation. Um, so you can see how every component works, and then there's also a um, workflow which has a more like in-depth uh, like string together definitions um, and some of them require plugins so it says like this one requires uh, anemone um, so let's see what's what's a interesting one uh, let's see what, the, what this one is here <laughs> I also forget what like half of them are anyway too. Uh, so let's see what's this one. Oh, yeah, so this one is just like making an array of mirror cuts. So you, it just starts with a cube um, and then it just like mirror cuts them and bridges them automatically. So that's what this component here, the mirror cut mesh, it like cuts a mesh 
mirrors it, and then you can create different kinds of bridges between. Um, so if I just like run that again, you'll see like it's it's so because animoni got so quick, it kind of like took the fun out of it because it used to be slower, and you can see it like more, like kind of like how kangaroo got so fast, and now it's uh, it purposely has the slower component, the bouncy solver. Um, if you remember, uh, let's see here file. Um, this one is fun too. So this is also a, a mirror cutting, but it does like a compound, uh, a compounding of the mirror cuts. So you can see it happening there. So that, you know, if you play with, you have to play with the settings, but that shape came from a box, right? So it, it just started as this box here. Um, and then it just gets you know, cut, bridge, cut, bridge over and over and over again. Um, and you can change the settings. And it's, it's really interesting because you can, let's see here. Uh, so yeah, this is, this is, this here has all these kind of different bridge options. Uh, so yeah, there you can see it being made like in kind of quickly. Um, and you can do like some interesting stuff. Like, so this one here, like depending on the thing. So like I start, the same definition. I started like this geometry and ended up with this geometry. Um, and it's a single closed uh, watertight mesh um, with bridges between. So it, you can build up some like complex geometry pretty quickly, um, which is nice. Um, let's see. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see what's this one. Oh yeah, so this one, so this is with like the twisted boxes. Um, so you can do like twisted boxes on a mesh here. Um, here I've made a, um, a kind of bat wing min surface mesh. Um, and then I'm creating different types of units that connect together, uh, as you see here, and I'm morphing um, them onto the mesh. Um, so if I move this point around, you can, it makes it very easy to make this kind of like, yeah, see here. And you can use like much more complex geometry too. Um, it just makes this kind of stuff like super simple and fun. Um, oh yeah, so there's just like a bunch of examples of like different ways you can do this with these these twisted boxes and the, the mesh blending. And there's also, uh, let's see, recently I, recently I added like color blending also to the meshes. Let's see, where is that? That's also not used very often in, in uh, Rhino, the, the mesh colors, the vertex colors. Yeah. I it's, think that's not so often. Huh? You, you don't see that very often. You don't. I think we should see more of it, right? Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> it's an additional information because when you are saving an OBJ file, I'm, I'm not sure if you can uh, save custom information for each vertex, but you certainly can save uh, color information and you can actually somehow abuse the, the fact that you can, you can have additional information. So the color could mean something, um, something else. It could be an index to some other uh, information. So, so it's super useful. You can inform the, the shape much more than just, just doing the shape. Yeah, because it, the like color is a lot easier to use than attractors because it's hard to figure out like if you have two attractors, it's hard to figure out like that kind of between space. 
Whereas with like, it's easy to uh, like, for instance, just like identify color by a tracker and then do stuff to that color. Um, it's just like an easier way to work. Um, trying to find where where did I actually do this color thing, but uh, can't seem to find it. Uh, yeah. I know I'm missing it here somewhere. Uh, What about you, Ian? Are you uh, are you planning to um, update your plugins? I'm planning to remove it. <laughs> to remove it. You know, we did a we did a um, we did a, a webinar using a plugin um, that was called Yellow. Um, it it was a really good mesh plugin, but the guy just disappeared and took down the took down the plugin. So again, like that situation. Uh, 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 now, just to be just uh, just uh, not to make fun of it. I'm not planning to, to take it down. I just I just really think that it, requ uh, it, it deserves a little bit um, treatment, uh, a little bit more treatment. And I don't think I'm, I'm uh, ever going to do it. So I just might add some comment on on the food for rhino um, page that like, um, you should you should understand that this is just like some sort of an experiment that I made and uh, yeah. don't take it too serious. Mm -hmm. But you know, the funny thing is that today, um, oh, here it morning is. Session, I found it now. sorry, just yeah. go ahead. No, it's just, I, I finally, I think I found it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this one is just like, so if you have like the different colors, it can like do different, you know, it, it also interpolates the color in like different ways too. Um, these are just, different color meshes there. So it was just like another part of the algorithm I added in, um, which I found uh, useful. Um, uh, anyway, that's how I was doing, uh, for instance, better to show here, like this here, like this example here. So you can have like multiple colors and like so you can like blend between shapes and then like also blend between the colors of those shapes, which I don't know, I find interesting somehow. Um, and let's see. There's also like Mateusz like gave me his his code and we add some uh, updates to it because he was like you with his mesh tools where he didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to, um, I guess, update it anymore. Um, so we just put it here and we, we updated it here. Um, but, you know, as you know, like, for instance, like voxels are just much slower in Grasshopper, uh, and Rhino in general, uh, yeah. especially especially when looping with with uh, with other plugins too. It's just like it's just one I'm of those things. Ammon is slow, but it's still incredibly useful. I, I cannot remember when when I had a definition without Ammon. It's just uh, even though it's slow. Uh, actually, do you ever use the 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 fast Ammon? Um, I do. Yeah, like if I don't want to see. I, I usually use it actually. I use this one for like display purposes, like so that you can see it. But I, I'll usually use the fast one just to get to the end. It usually, it, it, I, I maybe I'm doing something wrong, but uh, very often uh, I've got I get some errors or just uh, wrong results with it. Uh, I just need to ask Mateusz, well, what am I doing wrong? So that's why I'm using the slow one. And but yeah. it looks good. I mean, I don't mind that it takes long. It, it's yeah. still better control. Yeah. And so like this, like the, I think we updated, we updated here is like that you can change like the plane of the, um, the voxelization, um, which was fun. Um, so you get like all this kind of cool, like 
you know, because before it was just like X, Y, Z. Um, so that's a fun, I mean, there's just, there's so much stuff uh, to go over. This one is using uh, like re like recursive mesh morphing with uh, anemone, so you can create these kind of like L systems pretty easily. Um, but again, like it's just like you know exactly like you can get some really cool and interesting stuff with that. Um, It's weird, like, I feel like my computer is slower when I'm on Zoom than when I'm off Zoom. Is that a thing? Uh, yeah, it is a thing, thing, and it's not only Zoom, but whenever you're screen sharing or screen recording, and it's, it's... Yeah, because this definition is usually, like, because this one I'm using, like, the, the fast anemone, and it's usually pretty instant. But actually, my fans are also going crazy right now, too. <laughs> Yeah, also, also I'm using, I'm sitting behind a notebook and um, when I'm on yeah. Zoom, it I barely can use, uh, I barely can access Facebook. And on my desk, desktop, desk, sorry, the big computer, uh, it's not it's not an issue usually, but it, it's significantly slower when I'm in a conference. Yeah. The funny thing is that the phone can make it easily, so I don't know. The phone? Yeah, the phone can like it, it doesn't get slow or anything when when you're on a on a video call. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, there's just a lot of stuff here to go. I I, ha I suggest like just for anyone watching, like just open these up and go through them. There's there's a lot of um, a lot of cool cool stuff going on. I don't I don't even remember like half of them. Um, I have to like open them to see actually what it is. Uh, this was like a, a facade type thing with attractors and uh, morphing. You have some like lattice stuff you can do. Uh, this this is an example. It's a nice bunny. Um, Actually, the, with the bunny, <laughs> we have it here. The Tussabox lattice bunny, yeah. So with that, like, it's interesting because you can, it's hard to see, um, but, man, this thing is going so slow right now. But what was that noise? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. My, yeah, can you, can you, you probably can hear me typing, right? Uh, oh, you know why I can't find some stuff? I realized these are old, the old examples I had on my computer already when I have new ones, that's why. If you go to the new examples, there's examples of blending with the colored meshes. Um, but yeah, my computer is just going so slow right now. <laughs> Never mind, I, I really appreciate that you did that. This, uh, yeah. like, uh, in general. But this, one, this one's cool. Um, I mean, I wish it wasn't going Oh, you know what it is probably also because I'm in stupid uh, Arctic mode. That's what's it. <laughs> uh, also, the frame rate of your screen sharing is really slow, so we we don't see that it's really slow. It's just yeah. So this one is cool because um, uh, this one is uh, using a twisted box array, and then there's a, a mesh boolean twisted boxes, um, which is nice because you can. You can put like so. There's these three bunnies just like jammed together, um, but you don't need to boolean the meshes. Um, the the array inside figures out how to resolve that, um, and the way it's doing that is it, um, it it it's basically like 
checking if it's in or out or how many things it's in, but it's also multi-threaded, so that's why it's so quick. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just really, it's really nice to not have to care about Booleaning meshes together because Booleaning meshes always is a terrible experience. <laughs> um, so in this case, you can just like just you just jam them into each other and like let the lattice figure itself out, so, which is really nice. Um, so, yeah, but yeah, that's that's kind of you know just download those and check them out and have fun. So if I if I had more time, I'll make something more for you. <laughs> But you, you've got your tutorial somewhere online available, right? It, it, uh, it. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, just, just, just these. I mean, you can learn anything. Like, honestly, I, I so stopped getting webinars, right? Don't you anymore? For what? Uh, so, so are you uh, still organizing the webinars, the, uh, the broadcasts? Oh, I haven't, I haven't done any webinar. Uh, oh, I did some webinars on, on Pufferfish, like using Pufferfish, uh, like recently with, uh, with the uh, conference I did with Sushant and Hamid and Arturo. Uh, I did something there. Uh, I do like webinars with it, but I, I have one intro too, but it's super old. <laughs> um, I, the, the problem is, is like when, when the, the plugin gets this big, it's hard to like make an intro. The intro too will be so long. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, anyway, anyway, uh, this was, uh, this was awesome. I'm really happy that you actually wrote me yesterday. Uh, it, it never came to my mind that I would just like that we could make something like this together, uh, because I was not thinking of that, but, um, it seems to me yeah. like it was a good idea, right? Did you, yeah. did you enjoy it? I, I enjoyed it, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I'll just say like, uh, I'll, I'll do like a little little Instagram plug. <laughs> if you want to like, oh, just if you're curious to see like more Pufferfish stuff, like, cause that's what I'm mostly posting. Either stuff I made with it or stuff other people made with it. You get a, you get a funny uh, nick at uh, Instagram, your ideas like backwards, right? Yeah. Yeah, because the CEO of Trello has the same name as me, so all the, the names are taken. <laughs> all the good names are taken, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah. Happened to me <laughs> often. <laughs> yeah, so you can see all the stuff, like, yeah. Um, the, uh, there's also subdies in Pufferfish. This is a mirror cut subdies, like reflections with subdies. Um, you get some nice um, topology. Um, on those objects, I think I have. Oh yeah, there's the screenshot. So it's pretty nice, like topology from those mirror cutting. Um, so th like that's one of the things. Like again, that's an example of something I wouldn't do without a plugin, just because it would just be annoying. I think. Um, oh yeah, here's and so like here's like a uh, uh, tweening a mesh and the colors of meshes. So, so. Yeah, check it out. Uh, follow. If you're interested uh, to see more and updates, so like that, yeah. Cool. So I actually have to go now. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Thank you uh, for doing this. It's um, it was a pleasure, and I'm very yeah, sure. That, uh, Thanks for inviting me. Um, I, I would really like to say we should do this more often, um, but in fact, we should meet more often when it's possible and uh, yeah, yeah, when we can travel. Yeah, let's let's get those things back up. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I really miss the times when, when, when we were meeting in person. Like yeah. everybody went, everybody yeah. was meeting in person. Uh, it was super informative. It was also uh, kind of uh, uh, we talked about a lot of stuff that I was uh, thinking uh, recently, and and I'm very happy that we actually made this conversation. Yeah, me too. It was awesome. Yeah. Until uh, uh, until next time. <laughs> I've got a little announcement to make. Um, sure. Uh, just um, uh, when we were uh, when we were uh, when I was checking uh, people asking on on Facebook, uh, we had a greeting from Anouk Viprecht. Uh, yes, yeah, uh, yeah uh, you saw her, and um, she she wrote uh, a, a long comment. I couldn't uh, I didn't read it uh, so far, but then I realized that maybe I can invite her to to join me for one of these conversations. And it's you so should. far, it'd be great. Yeah. 
And I did already, and she uh, agreed already. <laughs> so we oh, are going to uh, Anuk on, on Thursday, the last day. Um, hopefully, it's still not completely arranged. I'm super happy that uh, she agreed. If she's still watching us, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for agreeing, and I will yeah. just uh, get in touch with her and organize everything, and we will sure. announce that. If that works out, that would be awesome. Sure. I have to go. I'll answer her in uh, in message. Do that. Yeah. Okay. Sounds great. Uh, I also have to go. Uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. It was the second day of uh, uh, seven uh, short stories of computational design, which is actually just, just six, but anyway. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m., uh, whatever time it is for you. For me, it's uh, 6 p.m. today, and it's been a long day. Thank you for yeah. watching. Thank you, Mike, for, for taking the time. Thank you. It was great. Bye-bye. You all. Thanks for watching.